we have, uh, I think, something really cool. And I think when you hear it, you will think it's really cool. We're going to continue our Testify series. Um, that's something we need to pick back up. So if you haven't done your testimony, watch for me because I'll be headed your way. Um, today, Luca Manel is going to come and share with us what God has done for him. So, Luca? Um, so, some of you know that um, my mom and dad have been going to this church for however long they've lived in Montana. And I've been going to Sunday school since about the age of three, maybe. So, I've been going to school, Sunday school since I was 13, which was about a year ago. And in Sunday school, I always heard people saying that, talking or telling me about Jesus and him dying on the cross and all that. And I didn't really think much about it then because I was like young and didn't really think about it that much back then. Um, but a few years later, in like 2012, our cousins invited us to a church camp and we spent about a week there. We did some fun stuff. And on the week or the day before we left or came back, I mean, we had to write letters to ourselves. And I wrote, we had fun and did a lot of stuff. And I put, I made some really good choices, thinking I was saved and I was set to go. When, and we'd mail them to, or we'd get them about a few months later. Um, and when I got back, I didn't tell anyone that I thought I was saved, which I don't know why, but I thought they'd figure out or something, but nobody ever did, so I still wasn't sure. So um, a few months later, about August, or no, yeah, end of July, August, um, in 2012, we went camping with their grandparents. And we were there for a few days, and our cousins came and I wanted to show my one cousin that I could climb a tree don't know why but uh, I climbed the tree and I was there and uh, I was just about to jump off and the branch broke so I fell and like just felt this pain and I ran into our camper and I looked and this whole side and right here was all scraped up I was bleeding and all that and I didn't really, I was freaked out and stuff. So my grandpa came in and saw what happened. And then we got it all bandaged up and stuff. I was still freaked out. And so then the next day we called our uh, dad to come up and pick me up. And so he came and then we went to a doctor's office and wait there for a few hours because waiting and the appointment and stuff. But thank goodness I didn't have to get any stitches or anything like that. <coughs> so I was happy about that. Um, but either on our way home or when we got home, I think it was when we got home, um, he told me that if it would have missed a little, it could have hit an artery and I could have bled to death, I guess. Um, so that kind of got me thinking if I was saved or really, or if I wasn't. And Oh yeah, um, so I didn't know if I was saved. The next year, 2013, in April, April, um, we went to a circus thing, and then after that we went to a sportsman night thing at a church somewhere over that. Um, <laughs> and so we went, and because our cousins invited us, and then, so we invited my friend Thaddeus, um, and we ate food, and then the guy talked about hunting, and then gave his testimony there. And at the end, he prayed and asked if anyone who wasn't saved wanted to be saved, saved. So, and follow his prayer. So, at first I was kind of, and then that is kind of nudging me, saying like I need to get saved. Um, so I'm like, I decided I needed to. So I got saved, and the hunter. 
asked um, whoever said that prayer if they'd raise their hand so they could pray for them and stuff. So I raised my hand and yeah. So then we left and we told her mom and dad and they are excited and stuff. And so yeah, I was truly saved in April 27, 2013. And then I got baptized August, sometime in August 2014. So yeah. Now a lot of you have got to see him grow up. And that young man that was standing up here just a minute ago is not the young man that has been in the church for the majority of his life. God got a hold of him and changed him. The look on his face is different. He talks. <laughs> he talks. Been in this church for nine years. I thought he was mute. <laughs> and he, he has joy. And it's just an incredible thing to, to see God working and, and how God took him step by step and allowed things even painful things in his life to get his attention. And boy, I tell you, if you got to see that thing when he went down the tree, that was ugly. And God allowed that to wake him up and get his attention. And thank God for friends that will nudge you. Amen? Because it would have been easy to just sit there and go, oh, I'm okay. Peer pressure works both ways. That's why God created this to be a family, to help hold each other accountable, to be knitted in together, to support each other, to go, peer pressure, do right, instead of peer pressure, do wrong. That's why this whole thing is a body. Thank you, Luca, very much for sharing. That was a lot for him to get up in front of everybody and talk, so thank you very much. <laughs> We are still in Galatians, chapter 5, so go ahead and turn there with me if you would. Could you go ahead and put that up for me, Josh? We have been discussing the fruit of the Spirit, or fruit in a life that is sealed and led by God's Spirit. And thus far we have covered love, joy, peace, patience, and now we're moving to kindness. And up there we just have a, a brief description I kind of summarized for you. This is Glenish. This is from the Dictionary of Glen. Okay? This is what, how I've been kind of going through this. These are the things that stood out most to me when I was studying this. Okay, so you guys can look at those, and, and we're up to kindness. And I, I have to tell you, um, a couple years ago, I was referencing, I was actually speaking on a different topic, and I referenced the fruit of the Spirit, and I went through and I was reading it in church, and I got to kindness, and I kind of went, oh, what does that even mean? What, what does that look like? And so we're gonna, I'm going to read the passage to you here real quick. And then today we're going to talk about kindness. So starting down in verse 16, I'm going to read. I'm going to skip over the works of the flesh. We're not dealing with the works of the flesh. Uh, quite honestly, I think each of us can look in the mirror and find some of these. So um, what we're working on is the fruit of the Spirit. So verse 16 says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. And then he makes a list of the works of the flesh. Now, keep in mind, this is not a comprehensive list. This is just an exemplary list. This is to give you examples of what a life being led by the flesh looks like. Okay? This does not include everything that the flesh does. I'm sure you've invented some of your own. I know I have. Okay? Going down, verse 22, we pick up again. 
But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh, flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So, again, this is an exemplary list, not a comprehensive list. This is not all-inclusive. Okay, but this is what a life led by the Spirit should look like. Now, keep in mind, not perfectly, increasingly. Okay? Because none of us is going to do all of these things perfectly. I don't think any of us is going to do one of these things perfectly. Okay? But we should be increasing in measure over and over and over. So, next month, you should be further along in some areas here than you are right now. Next year, you should be further along even then. And so on and so forth. All right? That's called growing into maturity. That's becoming Christ-like. So, we have talked about love and joy and peace and patience. Now we're going to talk about kindness. And i, I got to share with you, kindness, I, I kind of classify things, well, I, I classify everything. Okay? Everything's got to fit into the proper box. And, and I look at love, and I can see, okay, yeah, you know, that's, that's, um, that's male and female. Joy, yeah, that, that can be male and female. Peace, well, yeah, because males deal with females and females deal with males, so you got to have peace, and you got to have patience. So I see those as being across, but when I got the kindness, I went, oh, that's for women. Because I see that as being a trait that is more typical among women than among men. In our society, that tends to be something that, you know, if you see somebody that's kind, if you see a man that's kind, you admire that, but it doesn't do anything to get you ahead in this society. In this society, you want to get ahead, you've got to be ruthless. That does not mean without Ruth. <laughs> okay? But I, I always tended to look at kindness as being more of a feminine trait than a masculine trait. And then I got to research this, and boy was I wrong. Boy, was I wrong. Um, I want to first, let's define what kindness is. It always helps to understand what we're talking about, right? It doesn't stop us from talking, because a lot of us talk without understanding, but it helps. So I looked up in the dictionary, what is kindness? I absolutely hate when they do this. The state or quality of being kind. <laughs> really? <laughs> so what is kind? Of a good or benevolent nature or disposition. Having, showing, or proceeding from benevolence. Indulgent, considerate, or helpful. Humane. Mild, gentle, clement. Hmm. Okay, so there's kind of a definition as to what kindness is, the act of having, showing, or proceeding, proceeding from benevolence. Okay. Indulgent, considerate, or helpful. Indulgent? Hmm. Mild, gentle, Clement. I don't get any of this. I don't get it. Um, honestly, kindness is not really very much in my nature. Uh, this is this is one of those. It's not even one that I really have to work on. It's one I got to understand. Okay, there are some of them like self-control and patience that I, I, I understand and I know I don't have them and I got to work on them. But, but this one is one of those that I just, it doesn't even register. 
So uh, this is something that I've got to work on. But what does Scripture say about kindness? What, what is this word? Um, for those of you that are into the Greek, the Greek is Christotis. And the definition is useful or profitable. Hmm. It is often used in conjunction with forbearance. Now, some of you in your Bibles, you actually have this. Yours, yours may translate it gentleness. King James translates this phrase gentleness. Um, in our, the translation that we're reading today out of the, the English Standard, I think in the NIV, the New American Standard, and the New King James, they translate it kindness. They've, they've made a differentiation here. Because in the original King James, they translated this word kindness, and then the one, or kindness, they translated gentleness, and then a little bit later in the list, they translate what we have as gentleness as being meekness. Okay? The NASB, the NIV, the ESV, the New King James, those are the four that I looked at besides the King James. They all changed meekness to gentleness because in our society, we don't use meekness. In our culture, we, that's not a phrase that is in common usage. So we, why put a word in there that people are going to go, I don't get that. I don't know what that is. And you just kind of bleep over it. Do, do any of you ever bleep over words when you read? Every one of you does. Especially when you get to the Greek names. <laughs> Give my greetings to beep and beep and beep. And we just bleep over them. Aristaba who is? <laughs> But now I want to share with you the idea behind this Greek word. Because, see, we have ideas that are conveyed with words that we use. For example, if I use the word fly, what does that mean? F-L-Y. What does that mean? Soar. To soar. Okay, that's possible. It's, it's a bird. <laughs> what, but, but what about if... Uh, and this is an actual example. We had a, a foreign exchange student from France. And we were in the car, and we were driving down the road, and we were talking about speed limits or something like that. And somebody in the car made the comment that we were really flying. And she looked thoroughly confused. <laughs> and I could see in the mirror, she was sitting behind me, I could see in the mirror that she just went. And so I, I asked her, I said, Sasha, I said, do you understand what that means? She said, no, I don't understand what that means because we're driving. <laughs> right. But we've taken that word and we've used it to express getting somewhere quickly. Okay? There's an idea expressed in the word that we use and you understand it by the way it's being used. Okay? So let's, let's look a little bit at what this, go ahead and put that other translation or the, the other definition up there. Okay. This is the idea behind the word kindness. The grace which pervades the whole nature, mellowing all which would have been harsh and austere. Okay. Well, what that means is that you are allowing God and God's spirit in you to round off the rough edges. Okay. You're allowing him to smooth off the icky, yucky parts of you and allowing His Spirit to exhibit its character in your life. This word is descriptive of one's disposition but does not necessarily entail acts of goodness. Okay? The way you can look at this is, do you know the passage that calls us to be as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves? This is the innocent as doves part. Okay? That's what this means. Kindness. To be as innocent as doves. To allow grace to pervade your whole nature. To, be, to allow it to, to just infiltrate everything that you are. To operate in and by grace. To get rid of harshness. Now men... This is why I was saying this, you know, I took, looked at this as more of a feminine thing. Men, we need this. We have got to learn this. Because we speak informationally. We do not speak emotionally. 
And when I speak informationally, my wife interprets that emotionally. And invariably, she, em she interprets it with a negative emotion. I don't want to do that. No. And she takes that. I hate your very guts! <laughs> How could you be so stupid as to offer something like that? And then she's offended, and I'm going, Maybe I should have said yes. <laughs> well, sweetie, if you really want to do that, we can do that. And, and it's not getting or not getting permission that is affecting her. It's, it's the fact that because I tend, to be, I tend to be very cold in my communication, especially if I'm thinking about something else or I'm, I'm not paying attention to what's going on in the moment, um, and that can come across as very harsh. Men... Have you ever figured out yet that you can't talk to women the way that you talk to men? You can't talk to your wife the way you talk to your best friend? It took me a while. I'm not there yet all the way, but, but it, I'm getting there, and I'm getting better. And that's one of the things that we learned with having a daughter and four sons. Because I can talk with the boys, and, and as a matter of fact, at one time we were all sitting around the table and we're bantering back and forth, and, and we're doing like guys do, and, and loving each other by cutting each other down. And, and Christy was standing there, and, and we had a pause in the conversation, and, and she kind of stopped us, and she said, you, and you guys, you know, you really can't talk to each other like that. You know, it's really hurtful when you say things like that. And she said she could not believe how incredulous everybody at the table looked at her. <laughs> you can't talk to each other like that. They wouldn't know I loved him if I didn't talk to him like that. How would, how would I know that he loves me? And, and we all kind of looked at each other and looked at her and looked at each other and we're like, which one of you guys is, you know, weenie? <laughs> What's going on here? And so I, I told her, sweetie, no, that's, that's not really the case. However, we did have to tell those same boys you cannot talk to your sister like that. Even when she initiates it, trying to fit in, and she comes and insults you, you cannot insult her back because instead of going, ha, ha, yeah, yeah, good one, Ron, she goes, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> they hate me. And we're going, I, no, I, I love you. That's why I did that. <laughs> so that's, that's why men, young men, you have got to learn kindness, especially in dealing with the more gentle sex. Okay? Mellowing all that would have been harsh and austere. Now, that's not all, man. We're not off the hook yet. You're going, hoo hoo! Yeah, because now, now I deal with men and women. All right? This is for both of us. Why is this in the list? Whose fruit is this? Yeah, it's God's. The Spirit of God. This is the fruit that just is who the Spirit is. So if the Spirit is in us, this is something that should come out of us. All right, so let's take a look at some, some ideas here, some scriptures. Um, one, did you know that kindness is used to describe love in 1 Corinthians 13? Did you know that? This idea that you allow the rough edges to be smoothed out is how love actually works and operates. The agape love that we talked about uh, a month or a couple months back, the love that God has for us is displayed in kindness. Okay? And, and so, when we are loving others as God has called us to love, when that fruit is in our life, we have to be kind. Okay? Now, I have a brother that is one of the most generous men I know. He will give you the shirt off of his back and he will cuss you for being stupid for needing a shirt. 
And I know that he loves me because he gave me a shirt, but I'm not really sure about the delivery. You ever, you ever be loved like that sometimes? You're, you're loved, but and you're not really sure if that's so loving. Can you hear you, moron? Take your eye. Why would you come out in 100 degree sunny weather without a shirt? I don't know. You can have mine. Okay, I, there's no doubt that he loves me. Sometimes the delivery makes me a little suspect. Kindness. Now let's take a look at the nature of God, okay? Because we have just shown that this is the fruit of His Spirit living in us. How about uh, Romans 2.4? It's on the front of your bulletin. Or do you presume on the riches of His kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? You get that? God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. Do, do you believe that God is harsh? He sure can be. Boy, you look at some of the things he did in the Old Testament. When he wanted to get somebody's attention, when they weren't doing what they were supposed to do, and he said, all right, I've sent you my word. I've given you the law. I've sent prophets to you to, to, to clarify what you might have misunderstood. I've made things a little uncomfortable for you. Now they're going to get downright ugly. He can be harsh. As a matter of fact, some of the things that I see David praying that God would do to his enemies kind of appall me. Oh, man, I, I can't imagine hating anybody that much, and I'd want that to happen to him. And David's praying in full confidence. God, you see what these people are doing to me? Get them. You know what? Let them go down to the grave. Don't even let them talk on the way to the grave. Make them go down in silence. Get them. Look at what's going to happen at the end of all things. When God separates the sheep and the goats, you look at some of the parables when Jesus is explaining how this is going to look at the end times. And the, the think about the unfaithful steward. And when the master comes home and he finds that the steward has, has abused his servants and has squandered his wealth and has not done what he's supposed to be doing, what happens to that steward? He is beaten. He is beaten and thrown outside. Matter of fact, in another place it says that he is cut apart and thrown outside. You don't think that's harsh? That's harsh. But what is it that God is extending to us right now? Grace. That's right. Why is he extending us grace? Because he is kind. God's desire, his heart desire, is that none would perish. No one would perish. Uh, I don't know if you guys are, are keeping up with the news. Um, everybody saw what happened with uh, the Charlie Hebdo thing over in Paris and, and the extremists and 13 people killed and, and horrible things like that. Did anybody keep uh, in mind what, what happened in Nigeria at the same time? Yep. 2,000 people slaughtered in a day because of Islamic extremists. I, I uh, received a, a thing on Facebook from a friend of mine that was talking about some of the... Uh, this person was actually a little frustrated with, with how these extremists are being portrayed. And he put some pictures up that he just gathered from different news sources and, and showed some of the behavior of these extremists. And, and some of the stuff is horrific. I mean, like literally throwing people off of buildings, like um, crucifying people, okay? Now, God in his kindness wants even them to be saved. God desires, he longs, he is desperate for them to turn away 
from the false ideology that they have, the false God that they're serving, and he longs for them to come to him and know his love. That is the depth of his kindness. Don't get me wrong. If they don't, there is reserved for them harsh, harsh judgment. But that's not what his, his heart's desire is that they would come to him and know his kindness and know his mercy. Thank God for that because that means that mercy is available for us. Okay? Uh, God's kindness. Um, Romans 11.22 Note then the kindness and the severity of God toward those who have fallen. But God's kindness to you provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. You see that? It's God's kindness that prevents us from being cut off. Ephesians 2, 7. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I was studying this, I was, I was a little bit ashamed because I had this, this idea that kindness was an attribute that was, you know, God kind of gave that to the women and we just left it with them. And then when I start seeing the kindness of God expressed toward me, I, I tell you, it made me really rethink what I need to be pursuing, how I need to be living my life, how I need to be expressing God's love to me, to the world, to be kind to not be harsh, to allow grace to completely overwhelm everything that I am and everything that I do. See, it's not enough to just take it in here. You, you understand that, right? Because I'm afraid the Christian world doesn't understand it, especially in America. We tend to look at salvation and the richness of God as mine. But what God looks at it is it's everyone's and he wants to use you as a conduit through which he can pour it out to those that don't yet know it. Yeah. It's like the example I gave with the cup. He's going to fill you all the way up. He will pour as much into you as you will allow him. And then he wants it to overflow so that it blesses people around you. And if you're hogging it to yourself, everybody around you is lacking. And, and you're lacking. Because you'll never get fresh poured into you. You're just, you're just kind of, this is mine and I'm not going to share it. And God wants to pour it out of you. Pour it in you and out to other people around you. That's why we are called to be ambassadors of what? The message of reconciliation. The, the, the fact that our relationship with God has been restored, he wants to give to others. And it's his kindness that is driving that and it's his kindness to us that should be driving us. And it's that kindness that is birthed in us that should allow us to drive us, that make us want to share this. I've, I've been privy to a number of stories in the church, some of the, the ministry that some of you are doing. Uh, personally, Christy and I have run into several people in the past three or four weeks that, that just, that they're, they're hurting hurting. There's just, just ache in their lives, and they don't know God. And, and I, I have to confess to you, I don't know how they do it. Honestly, I, without God, I don't know how they can cope. There is no hope. Man, without God, if I were in your situation, without God, I'd been done. I don't know how they do it. That's why God put me there. That's why God put Christy and I there, that we can minister that hope to them. And some of you are in the exact same place. People that you work with, people that you, that you uh, encounter in your neighborhood, people that you encounter just, just through day-to-day -day living. And they're hurting. And they don't know God. 
And we have opportunity to give them hope. And that's what we're called to do, to give them hope. The same hope that we have, not just in eternity. Yeah, we've got hope in eternity that's incredible. Not a hope that is, is something that we think might happen. It's a hope that we're waiting for it to be fulfilled. But we have hope in this life because he had said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. I will be your strong tower, your refuge, your rock. I will be your shield and defender. I will be your provision. I will be the banner lifted over you. I will be your peace. This is what we have. Now we all too often forget that, especially in the moment when things get tense, when, when things don't go the way. I, I'll, I'll tell you a story, all right? Christmas party, Band Note Family 2014. Party was supposed to start at what time? Six. Six? Or 6.30, I don't remember. I don't remember. <laughs> Nobody else knew either. I, I thought it was 6, and, and there was confusion that it was going to start at 5.30. I don't know. I, that's not my department. My department is to put away what she tells me to put away and clean what she tells me to clean. She takes care of the timings and the dates and stuff. But we knew within about 45 minutes, people were going to start showing up. We didn't know that they were actually going to start showing up within 15 minutes. <laughs> And that's okay, <laughs> because we're going through doing the last minute preparations, getting the food laid out, and I, I happen to glance outside and there's a police car sitting in my driveway. Whoa. Well, that's not all that unusual. Before you jump to conclusion, <laughs> let me explain. Because we have a friend who is a police officer. <laughs> you guys, get your mind, you sick. <laughs> We have a friend that used to be our next door neighbor that, that when he's in the neighborhood, oftentimes he'll stop by and say hi. And so I, I looked out and I thought, oh, okay, it's Travis. And, and I went outside and as I got closer, this is not Travis. Hmm. So I walk up and I, I don't want to, you don't, if a police officer doesn't know you there, you don't want to surprise him. <laughs> so I just kind of stood waiting and he was talking and he was looking down at something and and he looks up, and I walked up to him, and he said, is, uh, is this uh, 2344? I said, yeah. He said, is this, are you Glenn Van Note? I said, yeah. He said, oh, I got something for you. And he handed me a paper. <laughs> I've been served for a debt from 2003 that we cannot verify is even a valid debt. This is 15 minutes before people show up. And this guy says, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Go arrest someone. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. I said, Merry Christmas to you too. And I walked in and I said, Christy, what is this? And she looked at it and she goes, I don't know. We never owed anybody by that name that money. And we still don't know who it is. But 15 minutes before people show up now, thankfully, Sally did show up because Christy and I were starting to get tense. Well, I never signed any papers to anybody by that name. Must have been you. Well, your name's on the paper. You know how to sign my name. The bank wouldn't even accept my signature because you always sign my name. And then Sally showed up at the door. Hi, Sally. <laughs> She thought it was an accident. No, it was divinely appointed. <clears throat> and she even helped us clean. Thank you, Sally. <laughs> God allowed things like that to drive us to Him. God wants you holy. And if there are things that are preventing you from being holy, you can forget about God making you happy. 
Okay? You understand that? Because God will do what is ever, whatever is necessary to bring you to him. And he's doing it out of kindness. Because God's looking at the big picture. He's not looking at the moment. Just like the little child that wants that extra bag of candy. You give them one. Okay, as grandpa, sometimes I give them two. <laughs> And then usually by the time I'm handing them the third, mom and dad say, no. And Daddy said, no. But we're like that little kid. Oh, I want this and I want it right now. It would make me so happy to have this right now. God, would you just give this to me right now? And God says, no, I got something better for you. I got something better for you. But this is what I want right now. No, I've got something better for you. Why? Is it because he's mean and, he, and, and, and he's harsh? No, he's doing it because he's because he is not harsh to those he loves. He will take you to the measure that is necessary to bring you to him. Understand that. I'll share one more story and then we'll, we'll close. I have a friend, a husband and wife, and she had been praying. He was not saved, and she was. And she had been praying for years. She would pray, God, do whatever is necessary to bring him to you. You know what it cost? It cost them the life of their oldest son. That's what, what did it. Now, their oldest son was saved. He was a believer, 12 years old. And God took him home. And that's what brought her husband to the realization that he so very desperately needed God in his life. I don't know whether she ever regretted praying that prayer or not. I, I can't believe that she couldn't regret praying that prayer, losing your oldest child, losing any child. But God honored her prayer. And think about this. Their son, while he may be gone from their life, who got the better end of the deal on that? You bet he did. You bet he did. God is rich in kindness toward us. We have got to be rich in kindness toward each other. And I'll tell you what, it's easy to be kind here because it's only a couple hours and we can put on the kind mask and be nice and be all goody two shoes and pat each other on the back and tell each other what wonderful people we are. But where the rubber meets the road is when you get in the car and your wife made something for lunch you don't like or your husband happened to say something that you disagreed with or whatever else happens to come up you can see if you're not kind in the closest, most intimate relationships that you have, what good really is it to be kind elsewhere? Why would you waste your time being kind to the clerk in the store and be rude and nasty and harsh to your spouse or to your children or to your siblings? Kindness. The grace which pervades the whole nature, mellowing all which would have been harsh or austere. Father, I thank you that you are kind to us. Father, that your kindness is just so rich and abundant and free and poured out God, to us. I ask, Lord God, that if there be any here today that do not know your kindness, God, today would be the day. Today would be the day. This would be the moment when they would give up their life. They would take their life and they would humble it before you. They would submit it to the cross. God, your word promises us that if we will humble ourselves to you, you will lift us up. And Father, your word also promises us that you are able to make us stand. So, Father, we thank you for your kindness. And I ask your blessing on this word, Father. 
I ask that it would be planted in good soil, that it would grow and bear much fruit. Help us, Father, moment by moment, step by step, day by day, to walk by the Spirit, to deny our flesh, to crucify that flesh, to keep it dead. That your fruit would grow and be abundant in our lives. I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.